I'd like you to close your eyes and picture yourself back in high school or wherever you were when you were 14 or 15 or 16. Now, I can tell from the number of eyes that are so open that not everybody wants to go back there. And if your experience was anything like mine, an uncoordinated, closeted gay kid growing up in New Jersey in the 1970s, I can understand why. But whether your eyes are open or closed, I'd like you to think of a time when you actually felt good at school. Even if it was for just one fleeting moment, try to think of something. Maybe you accomplished something that made you feel smart, or discovered a hidden talent, or had a teacher who believed in you. Now, with that memory in the back of your mind, I'd like you to open your eyes and try to think of a word to complete this sentence. I believe all students deserve to feel blank at school. Whatever comes to mind, I deserve, excuse me, I believe all students deserve to feel blank at school. Just record your word or maybe a couple of words on that invisible notepad in your mind. Now, I'm a former high school teacher, and now I teach youth development, mostly to undergrads and grad students who are interested in teaching. I also do workshops with teachers and school administrators around the country, so I do this exercise a lot. And one word that someone in the group almost always comes up with is safe. People believe all students deserve to feel safe at school. And they should. Safety is a prerequisite for learning. If students don't feel safe, they can't focus on reading or writing or math. They can't make music or art or theater if they have to watch their backs every day. Now, I'm going to share a number with you. 82%. This is the percentage of students who, in a recent survey, said they sometimes or often feel unsafe at school. That number is from the National School Climate Survey by GLSEN, the Gay, Lesbian, and Straight Education Network. And it's based on more than 22,000 students who self-identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, or somewhere else under the LGBTQ umbrella. And they most frequently felt unsafe for reasons associated with their sexual orientation or gender identity. How many young people does that 82% translate to? Well, we don't know exactly. But national estimates are that there are about 1.9 million LGBTQ young people in the United States. So we could easily be talking about more than 1.5 million young people who right now, as I give this talk, don't feel safe in their schools. A million and a half. Why are so many LGBTQ young people saying they don't feel safe in their schools? Well, 68%, more than two-thirds, say they often hear homophobic or transphobic language. Four out of five have been verbally harassed, either in school or on school grounds. And about a third have been physically harassed. So lack of safety is a major problem for LGBTQ students in the United States. But here's another problem. When I asked you to fill in that blank a few minutes ago, you probably thought of all sorts of words. You may have thought all students deserve to feel affirmed or supported or even celebrated. Safe, if you stop and think about it, is a pretty low bar for what we want students to feel at school. Yet I would argue that even in places where well-meaning educators are trying to make things better for LGBTQ plus kids, that's where we're stuck. We try to keep students safe with anti-bullying programs and zero tolerance policies. We tamp down on slurs and harassment. Maybe a few teachers have safe zone stickers on their doors, indicating that their classrooms are safe spaces, an oasis in what otherwise might be an unfriendly school building. All these things are important, but are they enough? I'm going to share another number with you that's a lot smaller. 16%. This is the percentage of students in the GLSEN survey who said there was any mention of LGBTQ plus topics or issues in what they studied at school. That means that more than four out of five said there was no positive or even neutral mention of LGBTQ plus anything, zero, in their school curriculum. And this number has hardly budged in the 20 years of the GLSEN survey. We've seen some improvement on anti-gay slurs and harassment, but curriculum that includes queer voices is completely absent from the vast majority of schools. And the politics on this 
has gotten a lot worse in the last few years. I'll say more about that in a minute. And there are lots of other numbers in the GLSEN survey that tell us how far we are from schools that aren't just safe, but actually foster a sense of belonging for LGBTQ plus kids. Fewer than half say they have access to LGBTQ plus student groups, or teachers they can talk to about queer issues, or teachers who are out themselves, or library resources that include LGBTQ plus topics. Now, I know I've shared a lot of numbers so far, but I want to share two more. And these aren't from GLSEN. They're from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The 2021 National School Climate Survey found that 45% of lesbian, gay, and bisexual youth have seriously considered suicide, and 22% have attempted suicide in the last year. That's four times the rate of their straight peers. And though we don't have good national CDC data on transgender students yet, and that's a major problem, the Trevor Project reports that transgender youth, more than half of them, have seriously considered suicide, and that LGBTQ plus youth of color are at even greater suicide risk than their white peers. Now, normally, this would be the part of the talk where I would say we're in trouble, where these numbers are a disgrace in the United States of America. But what I'm going to say instead is that these numbers probably underestimate the current reality. Because since then, these surveys were done in 2021. And since that time, we've seen a wave of laws, mostly at the state level, that threaten the mental health and well-being of LGBTQ kids. Now, I'm sure all of you have heard of the don't say gay laws, or don't say trans, or don't say anything LGBTQ plus ever laws that are now making their way across the country, especially in the South. These laws bar discussion of LGBTQ plus literature, history, issues, or people, sometimes at certain grade levels, sometimes across the board. The dark orange on this map from the Movement Advancement Project shows where these laws are in effect. And the lighter orange shows where parental permission is required for students to study anything LGBTQ plus related, which probably means they won't study it at all. Now, I want to take a minute and talk about Florida, which in many ways is where this entire wave of legislation got started. In Florida, it's now illegal to teach any content that relates to LGBTQ people or issues from pre-K all the way up through sen students' senior year in high school. So if you are a gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, queer, or questioning student in Florida, your teachers are legally prohibited from acknowledging, much less affirming, that aspect of your identity at school. In Florida alone, the State Department of Education reported that more than 300 books were removed from schools last year, many for how they depict gender or sexual orientation. In a recent article in Education Week, here's what a Florida high school student said it feels like to be an LGBTQ plus student there these days. We can feel when we're not welcome, as any person can. And legislation like this tells certain students that they're not welcome. State laws that tell students they're not welcome in their schools. That's a far cry from the words you probably thought of when I gave you that prompt a few minutes ago. And no group of students has probably been made to feel less welcome in their schools recently than transgender students. Nine states all the ones highlighted in either orange or red, now have laws that restrict what bathroom transgender students can use at school. State laws literally telling kids where they can and can't go to the bathroom. 23 states, all the ones highlighted in orange, now have bans on transgender students participating in school sports according to their gender identity. And this is on top of all the bans on gender-affirming care care that has been deemed medically necessary by the American Medical Association. So for those of us who want to build up LGBTQ plus kids, there seem to be more obstacles every day. But the need to support them has only grown as more and more bills emerge that try to legislate them out of existence. So how do we do it? Now, I'm not about to stand here on my relatively safe TEDx stage in New York and tell teachers in Florida that they should risk their jobs and teach LGBTQ history and literature anyway. Now more than ever, these kids need caring teachers by their side. But there are some things we can do from wherever we sit. 
to insist that schools become places that aren't just safe, but inclusive and affirming too. First, in addition to fighting book banning and other forms of censorship, we can be on the alert for self-censorship. The politicians who have crafted these laws have used deliberately vague language, like age inappropriate, to intimidate teachers into avoiding anything and everything queer. Now, I believe most educators care about their students and want to do the right thing. But many are overinterpreting these laws, extending their reach beyond the grade levels they apply to, beyond what they actually say. It's even happening in states where these laws aren't in effect at all. A 2023 Rand Corporation survey found that many teachers in states without don't say gay laws are actually restricting their curricular content away from gender, race, and sexuality. So we need to make sure we're clear about what these laws say and what they don't say. Two, push for inclusive teaching where it's still legally possible and for laws that not only support it, but mandate it. Now I'm going to show you a map I showed you a few minutes ago, but now I'm going to ask you to focus on the green states. California, Oregon, Nevada, Colorado, Illinois, New Jersey, and Connecticut all have laws that require the teaching of LGBTQ plus content in state curriculum standards. More states, cities, and towns need to be doing this, especially when we know that teachers in states without don't say gay laws are avoiding queer content. It's essential that local and state governments make it clear this kind of curricular inclusion is not only okay, it's the law. A high school teacher I've known for a long time, Sarah Barber Just, teaches a course on LGBTQ literature. She's taught it for 21 years. Students read James Baldwin and Rita Mae Brown. They learn about the Stonewall Uprising and Harvey Milk. Here's an excerpt from Sarah's syllabus. Students in public schools have been reading literary classics by LGBTQ authors for more than a century. However, these authors' lives are often concealed rather than rightfully explored. This course closely examines the struggles and triumphs of these artists as well as the historical periods during which they wrote, allowing readers to more deeply analyze their diverse literary contributions. Now granted, this is in the relatively liberal college town of Amherst, Massachusetts, but doesn't that sound like the kind of honest account of literary history all students should be exposed to? And Sarah assures me that in 21 years, not a single student has turned gay or trans as a result of taking her class. Here's another example of a school making students feel more than safe. This is from Jericho Middle School, and it's a lobby display they had several years ago in honor of National Coming Out Day. Each door represents a different part of the lifelong journey of coming out, symbolizing that we don't just come out once, but we come out many times throughout our lives. First to ourselves, then our families, then our schools, then our faith community if we have one, then our college friends, than our colleagues at work. Each door has a message inside it like this one. The bedroom symbolizes safety, personal space, and reflection. The first person you come out to is yourself. This is the beginning of your journey to becoming your authentic you. Stand tall, be proud. Now we probably won't be seeing many displays like this in Florida anytime soon, but imagine if we did, and imagine what it would be like to be a kid struggling with their identity and walk through one of these doors on their way to class. Third, find your allies. Florida calls its legislation the parental rights in education law. An Oklahoma bill is called My Child, My Choice. A national far-right group, cleverly called Moms for Liberty, is trying to infiltrate school boards and implement anti-inclusion policies in school districts around the country. Names like these are based on the false assumption that LGBTQ student rights and parents' rights are at odds. But a lot of parents and guardians want their kids to learn LGBTQ plus literature and history. They want their kids to be supported and affirmed at school. So find the people who are on your side and on the side of the kids. They're out there. And don't accept the lie that parents don't want schools to be inclusive. Fourth, help young people stand up for their rights. There are lots of examples out there of students 
standing back against these laws. They're staging walkouts and teach-ins in their schools. They're writing op-eds for the local newspaper. They're claiming their First Amendment rights. Anything we can do to support them in these efforts, whether it's through education or publicity or donating to a GoFundMe page or a youth support organization, it makes a difference. And my last idea is a simple one. Vote. Because any politician who would use an already vulnerable population of kids as political pawns and thus risk their lives should not hold public office. If we truly believe that every student deserves to feel not just safe, but represented, affirmed, and celebrated at school, then we need to elect leaders who will send that message too. Thank you.